Okay, and uh, welcome everybody for episode four of Get It 2022. How time flies. And today I'm very privileged to have Mark Bibuik. I hope I pronounced your surname correct, Mark. You know what? It's a it's a complicated name, so I respond to all pronunciations of it so long okay, as it and roughly what is sounds. The correct <laughs> pronunciation. Well, I think if you were from, you know, if, if I were in Belgium, I might still say Bebek, um, but uh, certainly with the South African twang, we just say Bebek. Bebek, okay. Mm. Apologies. So, no, no apologies um, needed. I've, I've, I met Mark uh, about a year or so ago, um, and we had some very interesting conversations in between. And since then, he actually became one of our first uh, ADAPT partners. So I'm really excited to to have Mark here and, and talk about something that is obviously very closely related to what we're trying to do um, with uh, the ADAPT portfolio. And that is this issue of thinking about how do we leverage IT for the best possible results business results, that is. Um, and I suppose the question then is, are digital age customers differently or different? Or do they behave, behave differently? So welcome, Mark. Um, it's nice to have you on the bill. And um, for those of you who want to know a little bit more about Mark, um, Mark is one of the founding directors of Synexios. Um, who, as I said already, is one of our our partners uh, in the ADAPT in initiative. And um, they do some really interesting things around the adoption of technology in the modern business context. Um, you know, so service management, enterprise service management in a digital context, uh, a lot of work that they do around cloud. And uh, Mark's partner is, is David Cannon. Um, so that gives you a little bit of background. So if you want to contact Mark uh, about any of the things that we talk about today, I hope that you do so. So Mark, is there anything that you want to say before we, we kick off? I think just uh, to say thank you very much for having me on board. And uh, like, as you've mentioned, very proud to be a um, ADAPT partner, myself and David Cannon as uh, the founding directors of Synexis. Um, I think you've introduced a couple of the different elements and where we where we play uh, around um, digital transformation, how digital technologies are used within organizations um, to really change the way that business works, because that's fundamentally what it's what it's about. Um, and yeah. we enjoy exploring all of those different topics. Um, so I think we're going to explore one of those topics today or an area of that that yeah. we'll see Absolutely. ties in very closely with Agile Adapt, that ties in very closely with ITIL 4, with DevOps, with Agile and so forth. So very excited to, to have this conversation with you. Great. Okay, so let, let, let's just you know, sort of set the scene. Um, the, 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 the topic for today is IT in the age of the digital customer. So mm. the, the first question I suppose that one should ask is, what is a digital customer? Are they different to customers that we had before? Yeah, uh, and I think that's that's a great starting point. Um, so I think it was around about 10 years ago, Forrester uh, came out with a, a concept <coughs> around the age of the customer. Um, and there was a book written by, let me get the guy's name here, um, a Jim Blassingame, right? He wrote a book about the age of the customer and what was fundamentally changing with that. Um, and I think there were, there were, it broke it down into three main areas. The first was to say, in the age, the, the, before the information age, the seller or the organization would create product um, or services, but you know, predominantly product is what we're going to talk about here because they're quite interchangeable. They would create that product. They would then market and provide information about that product. And then the buyer or customer would make a buying decision based on whatever information they can get. But usually that information was 
heavily driven by the marketing of the selling company um, as well as the salesman. So, for example, in a car, uh, buying a car, the information that the buyer had was only what was available in the company brochures and what the salesman was telling them. Yeah. The age of the customer predicted that um, the big shift was in, in area number two, which is around the information available to the customer changed massively. And that was really true. Um, social media, for one, um, really provided a huge amount more information, but not only just information, but also influence. So mm -hmm. there was a lot broader influence in terms of who uh, your peers and these became your virtual peers thought was cool and you had this rise of social media influences right um but also as part of that shift there was also starting to become a change in what people value or what the customer values in terms of what it is that they're actually buying and not only in terms of functionality but also what is my experience like what is um the organization that i'm actually buying from what are they about what is their kind of purpose right and if you know simon sinek you know he talks about in in his book start with why he talks about apple being a purpose-based company or they focus on their why and then they talk about what it is that they they do or how they do it and then what what they do and that really tapped into that trend that that we kind of see so now, if we fast forward a little bit and we start, start to say, well, what has also happened with this new age um, now beyond the age of the customer, because these ages now seem to be compressing like everything else. And it's just a few years before we shift into the next thing. Now, in the age of the digital customer, some other fundamental things have, have happened in, in my view. This is my personal view of things and what I think about it. So if we talk about the product itself, um, so in the age of the customer, what was written about was the seller controls the product, um, i.e. they design it, they build it, they sell it, and so forth, right? They design what the features are, the functionality, what its performance is going to be like, and so forth. In the age of the digital customer, because the digital customer has so much more say, but also is so much quicker to change their allegiance to a particular brand or product, they can shift very, very quickly. And part of this is also driven by um, our shift to a services or cons consumption-based economy. So we're not buying a physical product that we own. We're going to use something on a consumption basis. Uber is a good example of that. Or Zipcar, where you don't own a car. Here in London, I don't own a car. If I want to go somewhere and I want to drive somewhere, I just use an app on my phone. I go and get the keys from in the car and off I go um, using the app to unlock the car. And I use the car for an hour and I pay for the hour that I've used it. End of very simple. So it's that consumption on a services basis. So what happens is, is now in this new age in the first area of creating product is it it means that organizations need to co-create these products, co-create the services that they deliver to the customer um, because the customer is continually changing what is what is valuable to them. They need These organizations need to be really adaptable and agile and move quite quickly to change what it is that, that they are able to provide. And I think that's, that's quite a key differentiator. Okay. The second area is around the in, in the age of the digital customer. So in the age of the customer, it predicted the customer has control almost of the information. But I think in the age of the digital customer, it really is going way beyond that. There is so much more information now available. One of the interesting things that I found really was um, in the pandemic, and I, I don't want to labor that because there's enough webinars talking about the pandemic, but everyone... It's reality. It is our reality, but everyone was spending, a, particularly in the early, early days, looking at all these graphs, all this data of the number of cases around the world, which country's leading, which country's lagging. Um, not that those are good leading and lagging indicators, but you know what I mean. And 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 where where exactly are the infection rates happening? And and you could zoom that right down to a city level. You could look at it at a, at a country level, and so on and so forth. 
So there's suddenly a whole lot, not only information about a specific product, but also you get information about the entire value chain of that business, right? Um, I, I think an example is that, that I might look at here is, is to say, um, people are caring about different things. So there was a big uh, example of a clothing line in the UK um where a factory in um bangladesh i think it was burnt down and a whole lot of workers died sadly in that because they were locked into the factory yeah. uh that did a huge a, a huge amount of reputational damage to that clothing brand in in the uk i, I think it's a global brand actually and um people are starting to think about where does my stuff actually come from yes you know, so we've seen this in the food supply chain, for example, where people will buy organic, for example. Or but fair coffee. Fair trade is another good example mm. of that. People also want to say, or, or are also interested in, is the product that I'm consuming sustainable? To an extent, mm. and, and I will, we, there's a qualifying element to this. Um, but to an extent, people care about what is the sustainability of the entire supply chain or the entire value mm. chain of the product or service that I'm consuming? And it's almost resulting in a kind of involuntary transparency of supply chains. And I think that becomes quite yeah. important because this data of what people care about, if the organization doesn't have that data and they don't know everything about their own supply chain, as again, we've seen numerous examples of that of, again, there was a, there was a legal case in the UK of someone who um, had a nut allergy and, and died, but it, the, the, no, it was a milk allergy. I apologize. Milk allergy died as a result of that. And it wasn't listed in the ingredients. What they didn't realize, the organization didn't realize is that the um, one of their suppliers who was making this sandwich or wrap um, had used milk in the factory. Hmm. And um, there's another example. You need to really understand everything, single step in terms of your supply chain, because if you don't find out about it, the media will, or someone out there who's some sort of activist will go and find out what's happening in your supply chain and that can result in quite bad publicity and loss loss of customers as well okay so if 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 all of that stuff is the reality that we have to deal with hmm. um, then i suppose the challenge for the organization is to preactive proactively know about emerging requirements and 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 actively explore what these I don't want to call them requirements because sometimes they're just whims, eh? Sometimes they're uh -huh. expectations. <laughs> yeah, well, and yes, you maybe you can call them whims. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I mean, sometimes you know people are really serious about they they want this stuff, and if you ask them, they say, uh, "No, it's actually not that uh, you know, interesting or important or whatever." But mm. the point is, we can't wait for the customer to tell us this stuff. If you yeah. want to be at the leading edge of your industry, you need to proactively engage and engage at a level that I suppose businesses has never done before. Mm. Um, and that's most probably why there were places like Cambridge Analytics. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, exactly. I mean, that's a brilliant example of, of actually tapping into kind of a, a, a collective almost unconscious psyche um, that mm. perhaps people had wouldn't um, necessarily show in their public persona, but somehow they managed to tap into what are people actually thinking about and looking at under the surface. Um, yeah. And how can we then present them with that message, that marketing, that advertising that talks to that? Um, okay, but... But the second part of the, 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 the title of today is IT in the... Mm, we're going to come to that. Okay. Can we, can, can we come back to that? Yeah, sure. In, in a short bit. Okay. Um, but yeah, we can, we, we can certainly we, uh, um, uh, talk to that. And I think um, maybe let's, let's actually come bring that in here, which says, so where does IT have a role in this particular aspect of it? Um, and... You've mentioned Cambridge Analytica, right? As 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 a technology organization that is 
providing a huge amount or collecting a huge amount of data and turning it into something that makes sense. That is actually yeah. data that you can, uh, or insight that you can actually make decisions off of and not only yeah. make decisions off of, turn it into your market advantage. Yeah. Um, and I think there, there's a key example in terms of the use of, of uh, emergent um, AI technologies, for example. Mm. But, but let's face it, the, the business is actually sitting with tons of information mm. um, and, and, and quite often behavioral information about their customers Absolutely. that's actually not unethical to use mm. because they collected it in the process of interacting with that customer. Yeah, and Absolutely. They, I, I'm not saying it's, it, then it's not a problem. I'm not saying it's unethical to use it. I think it's 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 critical for an organization to use whatever data they have legally obtained. Um, and I think that's quite a key differentiator when it comes to talking to about you know ethics of, of business. What data have they legally obtained that they can use to market to the customer? So let's let's take mm -hmm. Facebook for example, right? Facebook has a huge amount of data on every single user, and you give that data voluntarily. Because you're posting on there, you're chatting on there, you at least you're an Apple customer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, of course. Then Apple makes the decision on your behalf. You hope. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry for interjecting. I just had to get a stab into Apple because both of my kids are Apple fans. So, so let's. So, we, we, this is now the second time we've brought up Apple. I'm going to bring it up a third time. And and remember, I said I have a, I have a qualifier about people having ethics in terms of what they um, are choosing and to buy. Sometimes the desire for something, or particularly where there's a lack of competition in the market, people will override those ethical choices. So where they have a lot of things to cho choose from, and they might say, okay, in my food shopping, I'm going to choose something that's locally grown because it's got less food miles, right? That's a big thing at the moment. Or I'm gonna use an app to identify um, which farmer this comes from because I want to tr have traceability of farm to fork, right? Where there's a lot of availability of m competing different products, um, or substitute products that don't even have to be the same product, people will make those choices on an ethical basis. So for example, I might go and choose to buy a recycled merino wool uh, jumper or jersey um, instead of a brand new one that's got a high level of, for example, synthetic, maybe it's got 50% acrylic in there or whatever. That's a personal choice because I've got options to choose from. Where you have a technology device, um, and where you ha don't have a lot of competition, people will tend to just buy what they can without considering that. So you, you, you will find people that will get a new phone every year or two years, mm -hmm. right? Without saying, well, what's the impact of cobalt mining in Africa or destruction of rainforest because of mining of rare earth minerals for me to have this phone, right? Yeah. Um, and and then you know here's me i walk around with a cracked screen and a four-year-old phone because i don't see the value in, in i'm not that sort of a person that really needs a new device it does what it needs to do and does it fine until it breaks then i will get a new one but if it hasn't yeah. broken i'm keeping it right but that's my personal view on things right but there isn't i know that it, at the time will come when i have to buy a new piece of hardware and it has some sort of footprint in terms of where it's been. <laughs> there's some of us that's got three of them on their desk. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you know, what matters to the customer and to the individual customer changes, right? But it, it's going to um, be a matter of finding out in your particular market what, what is it mm. that you want to appeal to. Um, and what is your competitor appealing to? to in in that space as well um and yeah. how can you make sure that you're ahead of them where you have a situation where you have a really superior super, superior product and loyal customer base like apple for example people are not going to ask those questions they yeah. will say i want the next apple device irrespective of yeah. of Just what that question. supply chain might look like 
how many times do you actually read the license agreement of stuff that you put on your devices? Never. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, interesting. <laughs> I want it. I'm going to use it, and I'm I'm willing to to sort of prostitute myself, really. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for for this benefit that I'm getting from it. Mm. And what's strange is that people are doing that not only because they wanted free stuff, they pay for stuff and still make those choices. Yeah, um, absolutely. But so are there a way that we can use technology to, to be, help pe people to be better informed um, about these cho choices that they make? You know, I think there's a lot of organizations uh, and um, that are you know, up and coming startups that are actually looking at this um, in terms of, for example, the amount of carbon in a supply chain or the ethics in, in, in a supply chain or sustainability um, within a, an organization's supply chain. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen, I'm trying to think of some that might be mass market right now, but they're third party to the actual yeah. organization, you know. So Yes, there's, there's a lot of startup. If 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 you want to do something, go and read all of the agreements that we all say yes for, <laughs> and then write something that that asks people about their preferences, and then tell them which of these they shouldn't say yes to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I would pay for um, something like that. Yeah. Oh, I for think. sure, absolutely. Um, and, and you know to call out those those key terms because it's so much to to work through. But um, you know let's talk about it from investment platforms, right? As an example, mm -hmm. there are there there is a massive groundswell and change in terms of 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 retail investors rather than institutional investors, and we've seen this quite strongly in the U.S. last year. Of course, there was the um, whole story around reddit and was it what was it called game gamestop that was at gamestop that um yeah where the the, the share price went up by like 600 percent or something like that yeah, driven by retail really investors crypto, crypto stuff also yeah absolutely yeah. and and uh, crypto is an, another another good example right and it, it drives this volatility in 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 um that the institutional investors struggle with um, and they struggle to predict. And it seems to go against what their own kind of analysis is actually saying about a particular stock or market or commodity. Um, and so the, then you also get these um, platforms. So a, a friend of a friend I know is, is um, busy with a startup on an investment platform that will look at um, the ethics in terms of an organization before you invest in it. So it's all very good and well for okay. an organization to say, here are our green credentials or here are our um, corporate social responsibility credentials and all of that. They have all of that lovely stuff in their in their company report, but how much of that is greenwashing? Um, yeah. And do That's we, cool. and, so and what it does KYC. then is it, Exactly. Is it is it go, it it goes and has a look and digs beneath the surface of that organization and then yeah. presents a different view to the investor and says, okay, so you want to invest in whatever company, um, this is what they're actually doing from a sustainability point of view. This is what yeah. they're actually doing in terms of care for their employees and so forth, right? And so it's using that information that is that is out there but actually pulling that information together and now using it to provide a different lens in terms of what people are are investing in now i i don't see it being very far off that you would be able to look at that for anything that you want to look at any any product that you're wanting to buy whether it's a car or food or clothing or whatever that happens to be or service for that matter mm. okay so let, let's just get back to IT um, because we, yeah. we, we've talked a bit about the role that technology can play, mm. but but your topic was IT in the... <laughs> IT in the age of the digital customer, indeed. Um, so I think we've spoken around uh, quite a bit around, you know, what do we mean in terms of the age of the digital customer? And there's one last element that I'd, that I'd actually just like to raise, and we have spoken around this, but I think there's a big change, which is buyers are much more likely to, or customers are much likely to buy instantly um, based on an instant mm -hmm. need rather than, and, and what is available right now, 
rather than um, uh, you know shopping around for a long time to find what they want. They want the data, they want the information, they want to get it straight away. Right? Instant gratification. Um, indeed, exactly. Um, and and I think that that is also going to be key in terms of how organizations are able to innovate and change their products and their marketing on a continual basis. Uh, and again, this talks back to digital innovation of products um, and, and the importance of the whole organization to be able to enable that to happen. Um, so um, what does that then mean for, for IT? So I think there's been a lot that's that people have spoken around about recently, particularly around experience, customer experience, right? So if we talk to to value and what is what are customers value, I think yes, they want their digital product to be um, to provide a specific outcome to them, absolutely. But also as part of that, what's critically important <coughs> is is it's is things like what does it feel like to use it. Um, what is that journey that they go through? Is it easy to do? I know I, I was shopping around for some financial products right before this call, and um, there were probably four or five different ones that I was co comparing and looking at. What did I do? I went on to Trustpilot to look at their their personal, you know, people's personal reviews, but also look went to look on their website and said, how easy can I find information about this product? What is the information that's available? Does it actually have a calculator for me that I can very quickly look at this and go bum 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 yeah no it's actually not going to work for me because of whatever right and 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 the number i probably rejected three quarters of them because they did not have a sufficiently good calculator for me to determine what it is that i wanted to do yeah, and that was a financial product right yeah so i'm not even going to consider them i didn't even put in an inquiry another one i rejected because their trust pilot ratings were completely rubbish you know so there's a very real world example right now of saying mm -hmm the digital experience needs to be up there for the customer to even consider working with you. Um, and, you know, there's another element to that, which is, which is around stability. I was talking to um, a student um, um, who is uh, at a university here in London about the digital technologies that he uses as a student, because, you know, it's now been two years since we had this pandemic there, I'm mentioning it again, but um, organizations, academic institutions had to shift very quickly to providing education online. Now, what he said to me was very interesting. He said, you know what? It's got great material on there. I love having the videos. I love having that lectures are recorded. I can go back and look at them again. If I've missed something, I can really get the information that I need. I can search it really well. But you know what my biggest problem with it is? It's slow to respond and it goes down about once a week and if it goes down for four hours that's four hours i can't do my work mm. because everything <clears throat> is on the platform right yeah. so the importance of having stability and that's not just responsiveness it's not just available it's 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 can i find what i need it does it have all of those you know in the old days we talk about non-functional requirements those are still critically important when it mm. comes to a digital product. Yeah. And I think this is where so, it becomes important to kind of tie together and say, well, yeah, we might be innovating really quickly. Yeah. But are we providing so, those non-functional elements for our customer as well? Pointless to have the utility if we don't have the warranty elements. And, and that, exactly. to a large extent, was, was always traditionally the, the main area of focus of the operations team within a... Actually, our conversation started with ops, IT ops. We did start talking um, about that. And I yeah, did want to talk so, on that, but as, as I was <clears> kind of thinking about what we were going to discuss and, and as the kind of thinking around this evolves, I thought, no, actually, this is about all of IT. It's not just yeah. IT ops. Um, yeah. And, and you know, this brings me on to another point around, um, you know, experience um, and the total experience that the customer has you know right from their very first point of contact which is i'm clicking on that website to have a look and see if this organization will have the right financial product to me so it's from first click all the way through to when i'm actually now using that product do their back office operations actually work for me can i contact them so 
for example, it's absolutely great if you provide a chatbot. And if that chatbot can answer my question really fast, I'm fine with it. By all means, give me a chatbot. But when that do doesn't answer do my question. I ask them questions <laughs> that I know they can't answer, so they, they put me through to a human. And that <laughs> is, is exactly where I was coming to. I have dealt with certain organizations. Um, I will give an example of my broadband supplier that I no longer work with. Why? Mm. Because I couldn't get to talk to a person. It got yeah. me stuck in this infinite loop of, have you checked this? Have you checked that? Go and check this on your router. And like, that's not my problem. There's something else here that is the issue that we need to resolve and I need to talk to someone. I could not for the life of me do that because why? The chatbot did everything. And this is where I think that organizations when they go on this digital journey they need to be very clear and specific as to what do they want to achieve from it because if they're trying to save costs and costs alone it can very quickly cause impact to the customer experience yeah and customer yeah, value sure. whereas if sure. they say we're going on this journey because our customers want to interact with us in multiple different ways and we are focused on what it is that the customer is trying to achieve and supporting that customer, then you're going to make sure that there are multiple channels available to the, to that customer because not every customer wants to only use a chatbot, and a chatbot can't answer all the questions. Here's a good exp experiment, Mark. When we're done here, go and put a survey on LinkedIn mm. and ask people who they want support from. I, I think um, um, it it would be an unres uh, uh, overwhelming a response for not a chatbot. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'll, I'll make a note of that to you. Yeah, that Put would be a fun exercise. Afterwards. Yeah, yeah. Maybe we've got someone listening who's going to do that poll. I don't know. If if uh, if Mr. Cannon is listening, maybe he'll quickly be putting that poll up right now. Um, yeah, it would be fun. <laughs> so so I, I think it's really important to understand what that what that is that matters to the customer and we've spoken about you know value not only in terms of the outcome but the experience the total experience but also yeah. the other valuable things around that in terms of uh, things like sustainability and, and stuff like that um and i think let's bring this back to the technology organization and where does that matter mm -hmm. um and, and how does it work i mean if you think of technology how often do we think about a sustainability of technology carbon footprint of technology we know that um some of the biggest consumption of power in cooling is is actually due to crypto right crypto takes a lot of power for that people don't necessarily spend a lot of time worrying about that um but increasingly technology itself does use a lot of of, of power and consumption how are you going to offset that elsewhere in your business or how are you going to make sure that you're using sustainable energy to run your technology services are you looking at who your cloud provider is is getting their energy from things like that so they, these yeah. are kind of the periphery value items but if we come more towards the center and we talk about okay i have these functionality that i need um so while some may really value are you coming up with new functionality and features on a really fast and regular basis um there was another client i was i was having a conversation with and, and they're really good at this they're really good at making sure that their front end that they sell their product on um, is really top-notch and works really 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 well however what they're finding in and is becoming more and more of a challenge for them is that their devops teams are spending more and more time in operations and fixing things and making things stable more than they think that they should be um, mm -hmm. and certainly more than the book on devops actually says so what are we going to be doing for them is um w the way that i approach this with them is i said you know what innovation is absolutely a key differentiator for your organization and you need to continue doing that and you need to be good at it however to keep your innovation going and going fast you also need to have really solid and stable operations behind that mm. and i think that becomes absolutely key because not only does taking the innovation 
making it something that you can operate easily and quickly and in a standardized manner it saves you a lot of money around that in the long term but it also enables you to scale um but the other thing of course is it it it, it moves it quite quickly towards a commodity once you have something that is a commodity even if it's within the organization you can then use that as a platform for further in, innovation and faster innovation mm. as well so i mean that that sort of brings me back to this idea that i starting to think about you know a while in the conversation now is mm. yeah you know, people focus so much on what it is that customers want and they don't ask often enough how customers want it mm. um and and that brings us to one of these central concepts that we use quite a lot in adapt and and that's the, the issue of jobs to be done um, yeah and and you know, have, have you got any ideas around you know the 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 benefit of actually job jobs to be done analysis uh, within a, um, a IT setting specifically when we think about designing new products and services for the organisation or enabling new uh, products and services for the organisation um, so that we don't have that how issue later. Mm. Yeah, absolutely, and I think uh, you know, jobs to be done is an excellent methodology, really, for for um, getting to the bottom of that. But critically, it means you've actually got to go and talk to the customer around that mm. when you actually. And that's what most people don't want to do. Exactly. They, exactly. they 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 would love to mine data and run algorithms and whatever, and that age-old science of if you want to know what the hell it is that the customer wants, ask them. Get off your bum and go and speak to somebody who's actually using your product and service and say, okay, so tell me about what you do, yeah? And what's your experience? And why do you think what I'm giving you is actually quite shite, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. And and how does that work in your day-to-day -day, um, activities, right? Um, is it actually making your life easier or harder with the tools that mm -hmm. I'm providing you? Because, you know, how many times is it that we've seen a person-based interaction and process be replaced with a tool that's actually makes our life harder because yeah. you know, I've got to fill out all, I mean, change for, might be a good example of that, right? Um, putting in a new incident management or change. Why well, have I not got to fill out all of this malarkey, you know, all this extra information that I'm not going to fill out in a change record? How is this relevant to the change that I'm actually doing? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I find that you know, there's, there's a good example. We're talking about, you know, you now start to say, well, we want to gather a whole lot of extra information about our customer, whether they're an internal or an external customer or about a process. So let's make them capture all this extra information. And then the customer somehow, for some reason, doesn't like the new tool and you can't figure out mm -hmm. why. <laughs> now, that is really counterproductive way of yeah. getting more information by making your customer answer more questions that doesn't really work for me either in my personal yeah. Um, experience. Yeah. yeah um, I'm, but I, I don't think any customer likes that. Yeah. No, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think one, one core concept that we haven't actually explored here is, you know, we've spoken about how does IT do it in terms of improving the life of the customer, delivering value to the customer and all of that. I think something that we haven't yet touched on, which again is also one of the key concepts of, of um, Agile Adapt, in the first phase is understanding why causes aims purpose and quite often i think particularly where you have a corporate it function um and let's take infrastructure where i've spent a lot of my career it infrastructure people lose sight of what actually matters to the end customer and how what they do on a day-to-day -day basis actually impacts the end customer and um, I was I was thinking about this, and, and and a good example from my career was this. So um, some time ago, I worked for a global bank, and I was responsible for the global WAN network. Um, now this was I don't know, let's call it at least ten years ago, maybe longer, um, where there was not a lot of undersea cable, as not as much as there is now. And the islands of the Seychelles had no undersea cable connectivity; everything was over satellite. Okay. And the satellite, for the most part, was fairly stable. Yeah, you know, we'd occasionally have a few weather interruptions and things like that. But for the most part, it was kind of looked after itself, did its own thing. And people were used to saying, you know, 
there's a bit of disruption in, in the in the in the signal because of 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 weather and so forth. But this one day, it was fairly early in the morning. Um, everything's down. No connectivity whatsoever from from Seychelles back to the data centers in the UK and South Africa. And we couldn't figure it out. We had every engineer we could find. We had the supplier on the line. We had everyone trying to figure this out. Major incident, right? Major incident. And during this time, it was it, I had the the executive of the Seychelles business, CEO, CIO, and so forth, on the phone to me saying, "You need to fix this." We have got customers queuing out the door and around the block. So I was communicating this back to my bosses in in who were UK based, and I said, "Guys, this is the customer impact that is actually happening." And now my bosses was you know global head of networks and people like that, and they were like, "Yeah, but they can come back tomorrow. Surely they can come back tomorrow." That's oh okay. Yeah, yeah they don't have to buy food. Yeah, you know? I said, I said, no, you don't understand. It's not like people just pop into the bank people will take a day off work they will then go into the bank and it's a big outing in that culture and that environment to go to the bank and uh, and do their transactions right their month end wages etc you know they need to get cash in order to 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 live in a, in an in an economy that at that time was not very card based right and it really brought home to me to say these things that happen at way back in the in the value chain in terms of of technology do and can have a massive impact on the customer mm. experience and it's about in organizations today m ensuring that people have that aligned purpose and understanding in terms of what the organization does, what it does for its customer, what impact it has on the customer's life, and bring that all the way back to every single part of the organization, whether you think you're important to the organization or not. The funny part of the story, though, which I just have to finish what, off. What, what was the cause? <laughs> this is the funny part of it. So it was my favorite root cause analysis ever. Princess okay. Anne. What happened was, it was getting quite late in the day. I think it was a 4 p.m. local time. Um, and I was just on the phone with the local head of networks there. And I said, look, the technical guys are working on this. They're doing everything they can. They're trying to figure out how we can, you know, bypass the main, anyway. And he, I said, what else is happening today? What, what's what's the day like in, in, in the Seychelles? Tell me. I'm assuming it's beautiful sunshine. He said, oh, yeah, it's wonderful sunshine. And, you know, we've got a big VIP visiting us. I said, oh, oh really? Who's that? Gosh. Princess Anne has come to visit. Wow, that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's amazing. Is she there on holiday? What's happening? Uh, oh, yeah. And she <laughs> brought a warship with her. Uh, what? <laughs> yeah, she brought a warship. Okay. Does that by any chance have some sort of signal blocking technology on it? Chaining uh... technology. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. So there you go. That, that, that was one of my f most fun, wow. uh, if I can call it that, incidents in my entire life uh, or sure. entire career. Um, just because. And of, it's actually know, quite scary. I mean, yeah, the Seychelles is not in the cyclone zone, eh? So, <laughs> well, satellites is really a good idea <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely but then you know i think it was about a year or two later we had a project to uh, connect them up on fiber so that was great um but yeah you know so totally changed things um i think though um you know to kind of bring us back to to where we where we were talking about what what's it got to do with it? and i think the other element is talking about measurement um and metrics and how do we measure value um now i know that you know historically there's always been service level agreements or service level targets and they talk about you know quite dry things like call answer time and okay. but even those can go quite wrong yeah, yeah, we <laughs> quite often they can go quite wrong. I remember another organization I worked with, the um, service desk was outsourced and they were measured based on uh, the number of, of tickets they resolved um, and they were paid on the number of tickets resolved. And what behavior that drove was actually they would, the help desk agent would answer the call 
and then um, try and get you off the phone as quickly as possible and then close the ticket. Mm. And when it was unresolved, you'd had to now phone back again, they'd open a new ticket. Unresolved, phone back again, open a new ticket. So they got paid three times for resolve one issue. So um, I just want to quickly tell you something worse. One yes. of the insurance companies in South Africa, their outsource partner um, convinced them that they should also use the IT help desk for, for uh, uh, facility schools. Uh -huh. So every time somebody wanted toilet paper, it cost them. <laughs> That's quite a cool one. I like that. <laughs> Smart thinking commercially on one side of the fence anyway. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I think it's, it, uh, you know, we were talking about you know, historically service level agreements or service level targets. Um, they all spoke about things like availability and uh, in networks, of course, we talked about jitter and uptime. Those things were important to application stability. But um, what is it that really matters to to the customer? Does a customer care about how quickly the call was answered? Well, maybe. Do they care about how quickly it was resolved? Probably not. They'd rather it's resolved right the first time and that they yeah. have a pleasant experience through that. Um, you know, so it, it depends, though. Because it may be that they mail us down and they need to send a quote now because 12 o'clock, the, yeah, the thing is closing. But yeah, yeah if it wasn't for that. Of course. Yeah. Agreed. But that's I... once again, this, 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 this thing of really understanding how work is done and how the, the business depends on these products and services that we offer. Yeah. How critical that actually is to, to be able to come up with something meaningful that we do as part of the value chain hmm. exactly right and i think that's that's what then is 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 critically important within technology but within the business as well is you want to understand what that value yeah. stream looks like but if you can and i'm going to credit david cannon in this if you can understand what happens in that value stream on the customer side as well and you can really start to map that out and 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 you have that full flow and that says actually my responsibility might go so far, but actually it really helps to understand what's happening in the customer end. Because yeah. what happens in the customer end is going to drive <laughs> the demand in my space, right? Yeah. Um, but that's the way that you should look at value, value streams is it's from requirement to consumption. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Consumption but is not the right what they do with it. Yeah. 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 But that's consumption. Absolutely. What do they do with it? They consume mm. to do something else. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. that's a, that's a good 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 take. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I think you know there are so many different aspects um, to why technology matters in the age of the digital customer uh, and how it can really affect change um, within an organization and within a business. Um, I, th I think, you know, I'm just kind of looking at where we are in terms of the time uh, and maybe it would be good to kind of put some concluding thoughts so around I'm that. Gonna, I'm going to put you, you on have, the spot. Or do, you, or do you have another <laughs> yeah. question for me? <laughs> so so you've got, um, you've got what's it, 40, 40 seconds before I ask the, that question because that will be the last question that I ask. No, go for it. Go for it. I'm ready for it. seconds now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... What are the five things that each part of IT needs to do to facilitate better outcomes for digital customers? So let's think about dev, let's think about ops, let's think about security. Um, I think, yeah, let's, let's, and service management, those four. Each one of them, five things that they need to do. So I think um, if we talk about, um, let's talk about security as a start, right? Uh, okay. And the reason I want to start with security is because security is, it's gone from being maybe a differentiator in some areas to actually being, it's, it, it's, it's a minimum requirement. You cannot not have it. Now, it's not to say that every organization is, or any organization for that matter, is 100% secure. 
but we have a trust expectation with our with us with um, the companies that we buy from that they are secure that their environment is secure and they're going to keep our data secure and i think that's that's number one um if i want to talk for, to it from a operations perspective um what i think really matters from an operations point of view um is about ensuring that you understand exactly what measures and what metrics are actually going to make a difference to the customer at the end of the day and are you measuring against those or are you measuring against um traditional out the book arbitrary arbitrary thank you metrics right control c Be control v metrics. <laughs> absolutely um so for example i was reading that um a point one second um increase in your uh in, in a website's um uh, response time um can lead to a 10 percent increase in customers actually buying on that site right on a on a wow. an e-commerce site right so there, there would be an example to say can you make sure your performance and are you measuring performance to that degree right from your the metrics, user's perspective exactly from the user's perspective and that's what's going to be absolutely important is are you measuring from an IT operations point of view what is happening from the user perspective? Have you defined what matters in that, right? And that then ties back to your strategy and what it is that you as an organization want to achieve. How important is that customer element to you? Um, okay. I would say then from a development point of view um, is uh, are your developers uh, and development teams developing functionality based on priority of what they think is cool or priority based on what the customer really wants, what really matters to the customer? Because if they're spending development time on um, a feature that is perhaps um, going to look really funky or but actually the customer would actually prefer a bit, or what matters more to the customer is going to be a quicker response time. Mm. Then you've got to think about, again, what is it that matters to the customer and are you tying what your projects and how you're prioritizing your projects, features and so forth based on what the customer needs and wants. Okay. Um, so I think that that would be another element. Um, what were the other, uh, so what have we got? What Service have we got now? We've got three service management um service management has so many different elements to it um but let's let's um we've already spoken about ops so i'm going to leave service operations to one side um i think let's talk about it from the perspective of service management needs to consider in terms of the overall portfolio and i'm talking both product and service portfolio in this. Um, port from a portfolio management point of view, are you designing for what the business needs and what the organization needs? Are you designing it from the perspective of, of the customer? Um, and you can take that all the way down to catalog, right? So um, again, I'll talk about this academic institution uh, as a client. Um, being an academic public institution, they actually put their service catalog out on, on public display not all of the details but you can browse the it service catalog from their public website um and so i just went in there and i had a look around i was like mm, this um this could do a bit of work here and um because it was it's completely written from the perspective of this is what how the it organization is structured these are we do networks we do end user we do infrastructure we do storage we that's what the service catalog looked like as is 99 percent of service guest logs exactly there. exactly flip it around what does your customer want to do when your customer wants to interact with you what do they want from you and i'm not talking about a request catalog because again you can apply the same principle to a request catalog but in terms of yeah. when someone needs to interact with your services they need to figure out they want something they want something from you what does that look mm -hmm. like Design it more, design your service catalog and your request catalog more like a commercial website. Because what do you want to do with a commercial website? You want to entice your customer to find interesting things and buy them from you. Mm. You want to do the same with your internal IT service catalog. Yeah. 
so I think that's 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 quite a key element there. We could again talk about measurements and metrics, um, but we've already covered that. Uh, you know, you yeah, can I, I just pixelated. maybe want to 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 add to the to to the death part is what perplexes me is how much bolt-ons operations needs to do because dev just never thought about the fact that this thing needed to be run supported maintained measured reported on yeah mm. um and and yes it's it's not a customer thing but it's informed by the customer and it just makes that's most probably why the devops team is battling so much is because they don't do that stuff and and you know the number of times i've come across projects that are measured on has it been done on time cost and quality right yeah. um you know has, 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 is, has it, how do you measure or, that? Or, yeah. or, or time cost and cost and functionality let's let me say that yeah. time cost and functionality um without considering well is this supportable is does it actually do what the customer wants it to do and and in that does it do what the customer wants to do not only does it have the functionality but is it properly supported do we have the right processes behind it in terms of people interactions but as well as how the technology operates in the back end how it's supported is it available and so forth um so i think that's that absolutely is, is a critical point you've hit on there um and and it ties back to what i was saying earlier about if you have innovation that's great but you need behind that very good ways of getting something new into a really standardized operating way of operating that is stable yeah. yeah because if you have a way of doing that um then it's going to be a lot better to continue that those releases continue that new functionality coming through that it just works well without without the operations being an afterthought yeah um, yeah, and I, I suppose that the, the, for me, the main, the main lesson in terms of this IT in the age of the digital customer is don't stay too far away from the digital customer. Hmm. Uh, you need to engage. Yeah, you, yeah. You, the, the, the value is not in disengaging and putting layers between you and the customer. Hmm. It's, it's in actually understanding the customer better. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, I think there would be two other elements here that I would want to pick up on and that is that is I, I think historically large internal IT functions have had the almost luxury of not being not being commercially competitive um, but they are part of the entire organizational value chain that is competing in a commercial space yeah. in a competitive market and the importance of IT functions to understand what their cost is and what the drivers of that cost is, is critically important. And I think the more visibility that can be provided for that, the easier it will be for the organization's digital products to actually be uh, appropriately priced. Because I'm, I'm, yeah, go I'm ahead. involved in a, in a project with a, a, um, a, a major retailer at the moment. And, and one of the challenges that they've had, and I'm going to use the, the, the COVID word now, is that customers actually found out during COVID that they can do a whack of things themselves mm. um, and basically tell IT to suck it. Mm. Um, and, and yeah, that at, at the end of the day, yes, you can say yes, but what about governance and what evidences? What about the customer experience? What about the sales? You know, if you go to the board and you say, but I did this because it meant so much more to the bottom line, guess who's going to win? And you know what? We could probably have another hour on this on this topic alone in terms of the use of IT or technology within the business. Because never before has there been such a lot of SaaS products available that yeah. a finance department, a marketing department can just buy and sign up with a credit card. That's yeah. that's 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 unprecedented in history. And the second is is um, I read somewhere that around about forty percent of technology workers, if you can call them technology workers, are actually now in the business. They're working directly in in, in business. The way it should be. Right. They're not exactly. And I think that that means that IT, as we historically had it, these large 
IT functions, they need to rethink what is it, what is our function? Where do we sit? What do we do? Actually, David on his link had a poll on this. Yes, was it yesterday? I think he had a poll on this. Yes. But what is our value? Where is our value add? Because yeah. if the business is getting um, the functionality they need from an off the shelf sales product that is probably going to be better than something we could build internally, yes. then why, why do we need a cohort of internal? Um, yeah. people within within technology and i think that means changing in terms of the roles of what yes. matter in, in 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 technology it's no Absolutely. longer going to be entirely technical focused people but actually looking at things from the perspective of saying well we need to be an aggregator of of certain services but not all mm -hmm. services we need to be setting some standards and guidelines but not all um and ultimately the business needs to decide what it is that's going to work for them yeah. to deliver that, that customer outcome so um, i cannot imagine any corporate environment without having a a, a service integrated function in mm -hmm. the next year i mean absolutely i think it's absolutely imperative that people start waking up and and understanding how big a part of service management siam is mm -hmm. Absolutely um, agree on that. Um, and and I'm not a SIAM specialist at, at all, but I just I just realize how how critical you know, that yeah. function is becoming within mm. the uh, the IT organization. And using scaling tactics to say yes, but you know this is all the bad things that can happen if you buy your own. It, it, uh, it's BS. Yeah, um, you're not solving the problem. Again, okay, when right. I say BS, I don't mean British standards, okay? <laughs> indeed, indeed. So, um, in conclusion, what are we saying? Um, you, you, you said two I, things and you covered one. <laughs> oh, yes, I did. Um, no, I did say two things. I said, I did said you, one is, okay. yeah, I said one is, one is people that, the, Technology workers, 40% of them are now in the business. Um, and the second was, and the first part I said about that was business or businesses and uh, so business functions can all go and procure their own sales software at the drop of a hat. Okay. So, or swipe of a credit card. Okay, awesome. So, Mark, thank you. That was a very interesting conversation. Good. It was lovely to have you here. And um, uh, Johan, as always, I've uh, been sufficiently challenged um, by your questions because that's why I enjoy having conversations with you. Um, <laughs> we always have great uh, fun, don't we? Uh, my, my squirrel mentality. Um, I just cannot do these conversations scripted. So anybody that says yes, but it needs to be scripted, I say no. I don't think uh, I don't think we'll do one. <laughs> no, I think that's that's part of the part of the fun of of these conversations is just a a chat over a coffee between us two that others get to listen into, isn't it? Yeah, awesome. Thank you, mate. I really appreciate it, and there was tons of value in this. Remember this, um, although it's streamed live to to Facebook and to LinkedIn and to YouTube. It is available for you to go and watch on all of that um, channels. So if it is LinkedIn, it's unfortunately my LinkedIn profile. If it is Facebook, it is the Agile Adapt uh, user group Facebook profile. Um, but you can go and have a look. Anybody can go and have a look on YouTube if, uh, if you want to uh, catch up. You didn't watch everything, weren't able to watch everything. You joined late. Um, or you want to share it with somebody else. Um, so all that's left now is to say, Mark, thank you very much. And, um, well, if, if any of you are in Mark's target market, which is predominantly the UK and then uh, around the US, in Europe they, they, and the US, yep. please do engage. Thank you. Um, I just need to remind you that you know, we, we're having this conversation with interesting people, but quite honestly, we're also doing some interesting stuff. Um, and one of the most interesting things that we do is we help organizations with a method to help transform the organizations digitally. And the driving force behind the method is innovation. So 
if you're interested in uh, digital transformation or uh, or digital innovation, uh, you can also have a chat with me. So that's my little punt at the end of the the talk, and uh, hope to see you soon. <laughs>